Yes, turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 3, uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 3, or oh, 2 Samuel, the same thing, Samuel, Samuel, yes, chapter number 3, I read from, let's read from verse 21, I don't know if Verse, verse, 30, verse 30. Verse 30. I know he had asked them to prepare for verse 33, but let me, let me read from verse 30. Second Samuel, chapter number 3, verse 30. Joab and his brother Abishai murdered Abner because he had killed their brother Asahel in the battle of Gibeon. Then David said to Joab, and all the people with him. Tear your clothes and put on sackcloth and walk in mourning in front of Abner. And King David himself walked behind the bier. They buried Abner in Hebron and the king wept aloud at Abner's tomb. All the people wept also. And the king sang this lament for Abner. Should Abner have, have died as a lawless die? Your hands were not bound. Your feet were not fettered. You fell as one falls before the wicked. And all the people wept over him again. Then they all came and urged David to eat something while it was still day. But David took an oath saying, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if I taste bread or anything else before the sun sets. Verse 36 says that all the people took note and were pleased. Indeed, everything the king did pleased them. So on that day, all the people there and all Israel knew that the king had no part in the murder of Abner, son of Ner. Then the king said to his men, Do you not realize that a commander and a great man has fallen in Israel this day? And today, though I am the anointed king, I am weak. And these sons of Zeruiah are too strong for me. May the Lord repay the evildoer according to his evil deeds. May God bless his word. We could sit. Now, I don't know if you have a New King James version of, of uh, verse 33 and 34. I don't know if our media team has that, New, King, New KJV, um, verse 33 and 34 of the same. Uh, you have that? Verse, in New King James version, verse 33 and 34. The Bible says that, And the king sang a lament over Abner and said, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet into, are put in fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. Then all the people wept over him again. Now we continue with our conversation on faith in action. And our topic today is the death of a brilliant fool. The death of a brilliant fool. Full. I, I'll, I'll begin that today and maybe wrap it up next week. And allow me to give a context to this uh, text. Because whenever you have a text out of context, it, be, it becomes a pretext of what you want us to say. So it's important for you to have context of this uh, particular text. This, this story happens when David has taken over the kingdom from Saul, the first king of, of, of Israel. And he has taken over the kingdom, but he didn't take the whole kingdom at once. He first was uh, anointed and um, presented as a king of Judah. And uh, the rest of the, of the place, he was not king yet. And this gentleman, who is known as Abner, was a commander in the army of Saul. And he did something. He took... Abishai, 
I think Abishai, or, or I can't remember the exact name, and made him the king. That is chapter 2 of Second Samuel. Made him the king of Israel, now part of the kingdom, in place of his father Saul. And uh, David had his army, and Joab was the commander of his army. He was leading the army. And now they were fighting to make sure that David is in control of the whole community, of the whole um, nation. Sort of one president becoming a leader after another president. And the new leadership has to stamp their authority in every space because everybody who is a leader has their influence. And when the new leadership comes, they want to stamp their authority. This is what was happening here. And there was war that happened in Hebron that was fierce war. And people fought. The army that was of David led by Joab came and fought and fought and fought the army of Abner. And they fought. In fact, the Bible records that about 390 foot soldiers were killed on the side of uh, Abner. And at some point, Abner was overcome by Joab and his two brothers. And uh, when he was running, the Bible says something very interesting about one of his brothers. Is it, is it chapter 2? Um, chapter 2, verse what? Verse 18. It says that the three sons of Zeruiah were there. That is Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now, Asahel was a fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. He was swift in his speed. And he was able to run quite fast. And as he ran to chase Abner, Abner felt that I'll be arrested and I'll be killed. So he got his spear and pushed it backwards and killed Hassel immediately. And when Hassel was killed, Joab got angry at Abner because his brother has now been killed. And he promised that I will avenge for my brother. I'll avenge for my brother. And David here is calling Abner a prince. He was a brave man. Abner was a brave man. And not only a brave man, but a discerning man. He died in middle age. Where he had some robust health. That's when he died. And he died in a careless, and I say a foolish manner. And in today's message, we'll learn two lessons and the other two will learn next Sunday. Because in our lives today, Abner may reflect a lot about us. Because we get to see Abner, the first lesson, is in a fearful danger. You study Second Samuel chapter 2, verse 17 to 24. The battle that day was very fierce. And Abner and the Israelites were defeated by David's army or David's men. Remember, the army that was meant for David was led by Joab. The three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and all that. Verse 19, Ab uh, Hazael, who was a swift man, chased Abner, turning neither to the right nor to the left as he pursued him. And Abner looked behind and asked, Is that you, Asahel? It is I, he answered. Then Abner said to him, Turn aside to the right or to the left. Take on one of the young men and stripe him of his weapons, strip him of his weapons, but Asahel will not chase, stop chasing him. And again, Abner warned Asahel and said, stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? Why could I, how could I look at your brother in the face? His brother Joab, of course. But Asahel refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Asahel's stomach, and the spear came out through the back, he fell down and died on the spot. And every man stopped. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner. And as the sun was setting, Abner calls out and he asks for freedom. And David, I mean Joab, stopped pursuing him. But Joab promised that I will avenge for my brother. Abner was in a place of hateful danger. He was fighting in a battle against David, the king of Israel. 
Abner was on the wrong side of battle. But he had purpose to eventually, and later you get to read chapter 3, beginning of chapter 3, you get to see him purposing to join the battle of the army of David. He was losing his battle and he was running away from the battle. He was defeated. And as the Bible has told us, he heard some foot, footsteps and looking back, he figured out there is Asahel here and I cannot outrun this young man. The Bible records that Asahel was a track star of his day. And Joab was middle-aged. I mean, Abner, sorry, was middle-aged. But a fearless warrior. But he knew that I can't outrun this young man, so he decided to kill this young man. Abner knew that he had to do something to defend himself. And in act of desperation, Abner took his spear, rammed it backwards, and killed Hassel. And by then, Hassel's brother Joab, as I earlier stated, was the commander-in-chief in David's army. You know, the funny thing is that there was a law in Israel then regarding the avenger of the blood. And if someone was slain on that day, the next of kin would avenge for his blood. He would put up the killer or the murderer to death to avenge. And Joab, the avenger, was the avenger of Asahal's blood. Now, I see Abner here as a great military man, a great, strong military man who had every skill to fight, who had every way to fight. But we see him dying, and as David is saying, that you've died like a fool. And now the sentence of death hanged over his head, Abner, because of what he had done. Come to lesson two that he was a foolish, he died a foolish death. And David says something that Abner, why have you died like a fool? That is Second Samuel chapter 3 verse 33. Abner was killed by Joab and what Joab did is that he called him by the side and told him there's something I'd like to share with you. And when they went on the side he took his spear and stabbed his sword and stabbed Abner and Abner died. And the question is, why is David calling Abner a fool? There was not any reason for Abner to have been killed by Joab because by then Abner was in the city of Hebron at the time. And the city of Hebron was a city of refuge. Years back, when Joshua was the leader, he was told, because there was no justice then, he was told that you need to set up three cities that will be called cities of refuge. And anyone who was in trouble, that is in Joshua, anyone in trouble would run into this city and nobody would kill him once he gets into this city of refuge. God, in his own mercy, set up across the land of Israel these cities. You can read this in the book of Joshua chapter 20. And Hebron was one of these cities of refuge. And Abner died at the doorway of the city of refuge, right at the place of his safety. All Abner had to do was to step into this new city, into this city of refuge, and Joab will not have killed him. And that is why David is telling, is saying, what's wrong with this man? He was an intelligent man. How did he die like a fool? He will just have jumped into this city of refuge and rescued himself. And this is why David laments and says that Abner has died like a fool. And you know what, friends? The story of Abner reflects a lot about us as God's people today. Because there are many people who are wise and capable. They can build 
buildings. They can give wonderful speeches. They're intellectuals, and some are even leaders. They are very successful in every other realm, but they die foolishly because they die without the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we think about the life of Abner, we need to think about ourselves because we could be in a space and a place where we are very intelligent. We are successful in every other area, in every other sphere, in every other realm. But we don't have a relationship with Jesus. Jesus gave a story, a parable in the book of Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 20. What we call the parable of the foolish man. And the Bible records, Jesus said that this gentleman had a bountiful harvest. And he looked at his harvest and said, wow, there is so much here. There is enough abundance here. What do I do? I need to tear down my barns and erect others again so that I may have a space to enjoy. And he said that after that, after the harvest, I will eat and drink and be merry. For I have enough now. I don't need to think about See, if I go on a stress tenor, I am okay. And God called him a fool, for his soul will be required of him that very night. And Jesus asked, who will get all this now that your soul will be required tonight? The counterpart of this man was Abner in the Old Testament. And the question is this, friends. Have you considered the value of your soul? Or will you one day die like a fool? Are you going to die right outside the city of refuge? And the question is, do you know who your city of refuge is? And your city of refuge is one, Jesus Christ. These cities of refuge were types or prototypes of Jesus himself. Because Proverbs 18 verse 10 says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower where the righteous run to and they are safe. So we can find safety by running to Jesus so that we don't die like fools. Jesus is our city of refuge and we can run to him. Jesus asked a question. To his listeners in the book of Mark chapter 8 verse 36 to 37. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You know what friends? Your soul is worth much more than all the stocks, all the bonds, all the gold, all the rubies, real estate and institutions of this world all put together. And you can never sacrifice your soul to the altar of things. And today, we could be in that space where we are forgetting that our soul is so, so important. And you have many people who are selling their souls at the altar of resources. That's why David is looking at Abner and saying, how did this man die like a fool. Because sometimes our focus is always on the wrong things. Our focus is always on the wrong things. And our faith in action should mean that we first understand that we need to seek the kingdom of God first and its righteousness and then all the others will be added to us. That is what it means to be in the city of refuge. And Abner missed such an opportunity with all his brilliance, with all his bravery. He missed such an opportunity. And good people, I know you have people in your offices, in your family, in your neighborhood who are missing this city of refuge. We have many people who even come to church. They are good. They are good members. They, they follow. They do all the things that church people do. But they have never taken an opportunity of getting to step into the city of refuge, getting to enjoy the goodness of God. Will we one day stand before God and God will look at us and wonder, what's wrong with you? I gave you an, an opportunity of getting to trust in my son 
of getting to believe in my son, of getting to become part of my kingdom, but you refused to embrace that opportunity. We could be in a space where we are pursuing every other thing, and yet we might get to a space where one day we realize that we've gone up the ladder, but it is leaning on the wrong wall. It is our responsibility, good people, not only to believe, but to go out there and tell people, your ladder is leaning on the wrong wall. And you need to embrace the love of God. Charles Spurgeon said this, that a person who does not prepare for death is worse than a fool. He is a madman. A person who does not prepare for death is worse than a fool. He is a madman. This, this is a pastor. This is a man of God who said that. That anyone who does not prepare for death. And you know what? These are not the days where we thought that uh, death only comes to old people. No, it's not. Death can strike any time. It can strike to any of us any time. And we need to ask ourselves, are we ready to meet our maker? Are we ready to meet our maker? We can have everything else. But we have Jesus. That's why I'm here to encourage you that you need to have Jesus. I must have the Savior with me for I dare not walk alone. So you better have Jesus today. You better embrace. That is faith in action. Faith in action is not doing many things. We can do many things for God. We can build for God. We can establish kingdoms for God. We can establish empires. But the first step of having faith in God is getting to trust in him and to believe in him as our Lord and Savior. So the question that we have is this. Do we have him as our Lord and Savior? And are we sure? And you know, I keep saying that, you know, sometimes you hang out with people and you ask them, are you born again? And they want to give you a long story. You know, I was born in a Christian family. You know, mamangu huomba. Weh! If you come home, you'll get to see how prayerful my mom is. That's okay. And then they tell you, no, no, You know, I went to church. I was taken to church as a child. I was dedicated. And, all. and the question is simple. Do you know, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? And if you do, it is very easy. You can remember the day that you were, you got born again. The day that you got born again. And the day someone prayed for you and committed you to Christ. It's as simple as that. It is not the church religious matters. Because we, we, we can have many religious matters. We can have many of them. But the question is, do you have a personal relationship with your God? With your maker? And have you kept that relationship intact. If he was to call you home today, are you sure that he will tell you, welcome home, good and faithful servant? Are you sure he will tell you that? Because anyone who does not prepare for death is worse than a fool. And my prayer is that we will not die like Abner one day where we had an opportunity of getting to enjoy the goodness of God, but we missed that. The second thing is this. Do you have people in your spaces who have not accepted this city of refuge? Do you have people that you know who have not accepted this city of refuge? Do you have your brother? Do you have your sister? Do you have your neighbor? Do you have your colleague? And have you shown them the love of Jesus that can attract them into this kingdom? Have you shown them that love? Because I think growing up, the, the way we used to evangelize was it is repent or perish. Repent or perish. But are we showing them love? How did Christ himself transform communities? By showing them love. By doing good. In fact, he was even accused by Pharisees that he's healing on a Sabbath. Because even on a Sabbath, it is a day when we are supposed to enjoy sharing and doing good to people. Are we calling people and telling people we have a city of refuge and you cannot remain in the same space forever because death is hanging on your neck just as it was hanging on the neck of Abner and on an opportunity came, the guy was gone. So are you telling them 
that they need Jesus. They need to have Jesus. They need to know Jesus. Do you have your neighbors who don't know Jesus? Do you have your neighbors who have not come to the knowledge of the saving grace of our God? And have you shown them love? Have you shared the love of Jesus with them? Are we bold enough to go and share the goodness of God with them? Even the high and the mighty, the powerful, the strong, the resourced, those with those big offices, are we bold enough to go and share the goodness of God with them? I keep saying this, that it will be so sad for you to just draw salary and never draw souls from your organization. God took you there for a reason. And maybe the next Charles Spurgeon, the next Billy Graham, the next Reinhard Bonke will come out of the people that will share the gospel of Christ Jesus with. And even those children who are in your neighborhood, are you sharing the gospel of... And I, say, I think I said this on Sunday. That those children that you see in your neighborhood could be your future sons-in-laws, sons-in-law and daughters-in-law. Yeah, they could be. So you might look at them and think, what? So if you don't share the gospel of Jesus, guess what? Yeah. So share the gospel of Jesus with them. Go out and share the gospel of Jesus with them. Tell them that there is no good in someone gaining the whole world yet for fating their very soul. There's nothing people can exchange for their soul. Nothing. Nothing. And the best inheritance that you can give your children is not resources, in as much as resources are good. The best inheritance that you can give your children is the kingdom of God. It's the best inheritance. Because that one cannot rot. They cannot lose that. That's the best inheritance. So the question is this, parents who are here, are we sharing the gospel of Jesus with our children? Or will they, get, will they get to a place where they are adults and now they are looking for someone else to share the gospel of Christ Jesus with them and yet you are one of the people who are known as Christian, as a believer in, in, in your community and in your life. We were sharing this, I think, yesterday with some people and we were saying, that even as we talk about discipleship and discipling others, it's important to start discipleship in your own house so you, for those who have children. Start by discipling those ones. You might be busy discipling others out there and then your children are looking for disciples. Yeah. That is good, good people. And, and we are living in days where we are saying, I... I don't think I, I, I need church. I don't think I need all this warmth of this, this fellowship and all that. I left church. I didn't leave God. There was that Kathingi that was doing round recently. I left church. I didn't leave God. But isn't that selfish? That, 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 that you are, your parents took you to church? You got the values and yet you don't take your children to church? Isn't that a little bit selfish? Or maybe let me try and be a bit kind. Is it that not being selfless? And, and Christ is calling us to be selfless? Yeah. Christ is calling us to be very selfless. That we can go out there and get to share the gospel of Christ Jesus. Some of the values that you have that have made you become who you are are values that were inculcated to you when you heard the gospel of Jesus. And you've become what you've become today because of those very values. So it should be so not being selfless by, by, by not sharing the gospel of Jesus with your people. Let's pray. Yes, have you, have you, have you jumped into that city of refuge? Have you jumped into that city of refuge? Have you accepted that? Or will you one day die like Abner when you had all the opportunity of getting to experience Jesus, but you didn't? 
If you're there and you've not given your life to Jesus, this is a beautiful opportunity of getting to believe in him. And you're there and you've not given your life to Jesus, I give you this opportunity to believe in Jesus. Are you there and you're saying, Pastor, I'm here, I'd like to receive him as my Lord and Savior. Lift up your hand wherever you are. If you'd like to receive him as your Lord and Savior, lift up your hand wherever you are. Yes, don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed. Lift that hand up. You'd like to receive him. Thank you, thank you for those hands. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for those who are receiving Jesus today. Thank you for those who are saying, I receive him today. The Bible tells us that whenever a sinner receives Jesus, God throws a party in heaven to celebrate that. You are there. I'd like to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Lift up that hand wherever you are and he'll get to pray with you. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Don't wait to die like Abner when you had an opportunity of getting to experience the saving grace of our Father. The name of the Lord is a strong tower where we, the righteous, run to and we find refuge. Lift up that hand wherever you are that you may get to pray with you. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Final call. You'd like to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Lift up that hand wherever you are. And he's a good father. He's a good Lord. His desire is to love on you and lavish you with his love. And guide you and order your steps and lead you in every way. So I give you this final opportunity of getting to believe in him. Maybe you are charged, you are taken to church, you grew in church, but you know you've never had a personal relationship and a personal testimony. You don't have a personal testimony of his saving grace. The rest of us, let's continue praying that God will help us to get to see the world as a place where the harvest is indeed plentiful but the laborers are few let's pray that we'll be used of God let's pray that God will use us today so greatly for his kingdom Let's pray that our, our Father will indeed speak to us and show us that harvest that is indeed plentiful. Our Father and our Lord, we thank you. Bless your holy name. We worship you and we honor you. Our prayer these days that you may help us, Lord, to become people who will indeed be used of you greatly. That, Lord, will be ready when you come calling home. And that, Lord, will not be found in a space where we die like Abner without Jesus. Help us, Lord, we pray. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's celebrate Jesus. He's a good father and a good Lord.